So we start from synth ADSR. Copy, paste. So this time I want to make a playable keyboard because that will greatly improve usability. But we got to add a key listener. Initialize function, add the key listener. And when the page starts, we run that initialize function. The key down function would be just like it would be for a game. When you press a key, it'll trigger that note. So we have to figure out what each key code is for each key, which is why I have this here. So then you can go and press the keys on, say, the bottom row here and get all of the key codes. But I'm just going to slowly input all of these different cases. OK, and so in this way, we play the index of whatever note we pressed. Well, as long as we have a play note function. So I guess I'll just say a pen note, keynum, note length, and then note length we'll just say is 1 16th. Also, yeah, if our IDX is greater than or equal to zero, because if you press the wrong key, we don't want it to try playing a negative one note. But also, we're going to have an offset here, just so we're not at the lowest octave. And I think with that, we should have a playable synth. No, why is it not working? OK, well, first off, I forgot the break statements, but that wouldn't be causing the problem. Oh, because I'm not saying play buffer, right? OK, All right. We can't just append the note. We have to play buffer. And you might want to clear it first, which I'm going to call clear buffer, which is just this single line of code. But that should work. And now I can play a song with the bottom rows of the keyboard. Oh, I used eight notes because it was an octave, but I forgot that that's the chromatic scale. So it's not even a full octave here. Yeah, maybe we should add the black keys too. Press the S key, the D key, G, H, J. Now it should be like a standard piano. Now, obviously this is a pretty limited keyboard because all our notes right now are all the same length. And I would say that it's monophonic because you can't play two notes at the same time. But I don't know. I mean, you can play this. So I'm going to comment out window to on click so it doesn't play Undertale every time. That also means that when you press key down, we're going to have to init sound instead there. Now I want to try and get it so that we hold down the note and it will stay held down until you release the note. I'm going to put this switch statement also in a function because we're going to use this same thing for uh, key up and key down. We're going to go key code to index, and then its input is going to be key code. So then we just plop this in here, and we return in index. Now, now I don't need all the break statements, and now I want to get rid of them all, because break, it looks ugly. But now I can just do straight returns, right, and change the switch to key code. We'll get rid of this whole thing, replace it with key code to IDX event dot key code. That way we can copy it for the key up section, but we'll be copying less. And instead of play note, um, I'm going to have hold note and release note. Um, but we also need to add a key up listener. That way we're checking for it. And now here's play note. So right now we're only using events to trigger things, but having a key held down is not an event. So we're going to have to have a timer check that. So in the same way that we might do for a game, we got a set interval. But instead, we might call it update buffer. And it's more of a, an updates per second than a frames per second. And update buffer is basically going to be doing what play note is doing. Meanwhile, play note, we're going to change the hold note. And basically, actually, we're going to be doing something completely different. So let's just get rid of that, as well as release note. So I guess we'll just have an array held notes, and we'll just add the key to it. Um, and in this case, we have got to find the key num because we don't know it. So we'd say held notes dot index of key num that gives us our index, uh, and then we can say held notes dot splice uh, the index one, where one is the size of the splice. We're only removing one element. And held notes dot splice here will just remove that key number from that array. So now an update buffer. Uh, the note length is now one over UPS. And then we're going to have a for loop. And that will go through all of the channels. 
And this will work, but it'll just repeat the note over and over again really fast instead of actually holding the note. But let's test it anyway. Held notes is not defined. Oh, I forgot to define it. Right, we haven't initialized um, the buffer yet, so we can't update the buffer if the audio context is not initialized. So we have to add a clause for that. So if we've initialized the audio context, then we can start playing the music. All right, let's try. Hmm. Oh, you know what the problem is? Is that we now have an empty sound array. Um, so yeah, in play buffer, we probably just need to check to make sure that our sound array is not empty. But if it is, just don't do anything. Uh, okay, we're still having problems. Did I do the wrong thing? Oh, not greater than is equal to, or less than or equal to. All right, cool. We're getting some sound here. Seems to be a bug, because that note just got held down and wouldn't stop. So if you hold the note for longer than a second... If you hold the note for longer than a second, the note never stops. That is a weird bug. I don't know why that's happening. Oh, I know why that's happening. It's because when you hold it for a second, the computer presses the down button again, but you never lifted it up. You know, when you're here, right, if you hold down the B button for longer than a second, it starts just doing this over and over again, so... And you never lifted your finger. So then we start accumulating held notes. We need to make sure that we don't already have the held note in the held notes array. So we can just do that by saying if held notes dot index of keynum is greater than or equal to zero, then we push it, so... Because otherwise we get a negative one from index of if it wasn't there. In that case, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't add the hell note to the array. Why is it still doing that? Okay, wrong way of parentheses. Yeah, all right, there, there. Okay, I'll edit it, make it look like uh, I did that right the first time. Oh, good, it works now. I mean, you get a very specific sound. It's not the right sound, it's not the sound that you want, but it is a unique sound that we're getting. But I, I wanna make it so that you can uh, choose uh, your wave type. So you can switch wave type with one, two, three, four. Let me move the type here outside of append note. Square, triangle, and noise. Um, and uh, make sure to put in breaks. Okay, you know what, before I go on to, just for the benefit of having something to look at, I'm going to go and draw to the screen. So we drop in a canvas tag, we drop in the canvas variables, we drop in a canvas element, we get the canvas element, we get a 2D context, and then we can go and paint the keyboard when we update the buffer, drop in a draw line function. So first we blank the canvas with white, make some lines that should make a square. Uh, Okay, well, it made a big square. It didn't draw lines, though. Did I forget how colors work? Ah, uh, yeah, I gotta put a hash in front of it. Refresh the page. We've got a box. Uh, now we gotta draw each of the keys. Find the key width. All right, that gives us some keys. Does this give us our black keys? No. Okay, right, I made the keys too big. Okay, no, five-eighths? Okay, and that skips over some keys. I mean, hard-coded, but for now, that's fine. So let's make it yellow. Okay, so this will put some yellow rectangles in the wrong places. Oh, maybe this will draw it in the right spot. All right, I'll bodge it for now, because I'll have to change it anyway later. Okay, yeah, here's our paint keyboard function. Yeah, so now I should make it so the notes actually like are held down properly. Okay, so I'm gonna turn ADSR off just so I can make the notes correct first. So I think the best way to do this might be to make each key into its own object. I guess I'll call it synth key. When we initialize it, we'll give it a key index. We'll keep track of whether the note is held or not. And then we have to keep track of the position within the note. This dot frequency, and we're gonna give it initial freak. And then just initialize the keys like this. So in a pen note, we get the frequency down here. 
So this actually won't change other than just the naming. Yeah, so the wave function's now taken a synth key. So we get the frequency like this now. But right, so the important thing is that I can't start from zero because that's what we're using to know where we are in the wave. Instead, I need to start from the position of the key frequency. And I guess we could just use sq.position directly. Uh, and I'll do this to all of them. We need to add uh, sq.position plus the number of samples. But now we want to say notes kenum dot held equals true. This doesn't really matter that much yet. We want to reset the position back to zero when you first push down the note. When you release the note, you're not holding it anymore. No, no that's still wrong. Ugh. Maybe the buffer just takes too long to play. Like maybe that pause in between the notes is processing. Mm. So this is not a trivial problem, but I did find this demo online of what I'm trying to do. But all the demos that I see do this create an oscillator. I think it's more fun to not do that because then I can control each individual sample value myself. Now here's an example that doesn't use an oscillator, but it lets you change the rate in real time. <laughs> But this is annoying, so I'm just going to ignore this problem and make it so when you press a note, it lasts exactly a quarter second. No user reactive keys today. Well, I'm just going to change this to play note. Okay, so now I added some HTML inputs at the top here. So at the top, you can change the waveform. You can also make it to the triangle wave. Uh, it can go from being a sawtooth to a more equilateral triangle. Now I want to see if I can make these waves pulse. How do I do that in this thing? So how does that compare? Okay, yeah, so what I'm calling period, I called wavelength over there. Um, why am I dividing it by four, though, is the real question. No, I don't know. Yeah, you know what, I'm just going to do what it says. Use P equals wavelength. No, it's not wavelength, it's period. Pulse PD, and that's the use PD multiplied by the pulse amount. Yeah, so let me just add a pulse amount, create the variable itself, take var samp, initially set it to zero, then I guess if I modulated by the used period is less than pulse period. So I guess, yeah, so if we're within the pulsed period, which in this case, we're just assuming that the pulse is always at the beginning of the period, and then the rest is silence after that, modulate by the use period, and then go and divide it by the pulsed period. Now, if I set it to 0.5, what happens? Okay, yeah, so here's with it out it being affected versus Okay, it's clearly different. <laughs> okay, maybe it's because I'm dividing by four. I don't know what that's four for. Yeah, because, okay, well, first off, why am I dividing the period by anything? Okay, that keeps it the same. It's like, even when I'm playing the full note out, I can't avoid the popping. Uh, might as well try to do phasing. So add a phase change, phase variable. Now in my source, when do I use phase? Okay, yeah, so instead of starting at i and not having i equal to zero, we're starting at phase and then going till the end of phase. Um, the only real difference is that since we want phase to be human readable in this case, we probably would want to make it between zero and one like the others. Phase times the number of samples, because if phase is a number between zero and one, that'll tell us how much to phase the note, but we also want to parse into it because we're dealing with integers here. I think we could just use i like before, but just set it so it starts at p phase, and it goes until sxn plus p phase. The thing is, is that you won't even really be able to hear the difference. It won't be obvious that it's working until we combine multiple waves together. We're going to go define them up here. I feel like decay is buggy. It's dropping straight from 0.5 down to 0.25. Through notes 0.8, what's attack plus decay? Oh, thanks, they're strings. Okay, so we have to surround these with numbers.
uh, what I want to do, combine waves together at this point? Is that what I wanted to do? So I guess let's add a second channel, which I'll do now by just copying everything. So now I have to make all of these variables into arrays. Wave index. So try peak is now zero. Zero is the start. So now when we go and hold the note, so I'm trying to just make it so you can do two at once. You know what, can I, I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna say make waveform. All right, whatever, just, I'm gonna copy everything, put it here, right? And then they all have a pen sample and it looks like that at the end of it. Switch on the type. Does this look tolerable yet? <laughs> and let's just go and delete all of these other functions for making waves. I'm making a for loop around this section so that each wave will generate its own value and then we can sum them together for each sample. You know what one problem actually is? I added octave as a config option, but it's happening outside the for loop, so I need to change how I'm handling that. So before I was literally changing the key that you were pressing, but I think the new plan is I'll just multiply or divide the frequency by two. Well, we could just say math.pow octave minus three, and then we say two to that, and then just say frequency times equals octmal. Right, okay, so we have to say octave w. Pulse amount is now an array. So again, pulse amount W, P is W, tri peaks an array, wave type. Okay, I made everything indexed. What else was I doing? Then here, now we do the W loop again. Samp zero plus samp one, and then send it use samp. Can I uh, double octave them? Oh, there you can actually hear it. I could like do 3.5. Okay, right, so that's amplitude. I need to do something with it. I'll call I'll call it wave amp instead of just amp. Now multiply the whole thing by the amp, because that's the general amp. And then down here we have the individual wave amps for each of them. Now we have some amplitude that we can mess with. So if we want to have a noise wave, right, we can say we can make this 0.2 and the noise will be quieter. But I should get phase to work because I don't feel like changing every instance of I. I could just set an old I, equal that to I, and then at the end of this loop, change I back to its value before. Then I could just say I plus P phase modulated by the period. Oh, right, yeah, and of w. Okay, yeah, so we displace it by the phase value. So we just set i equal to that. So if we change both of their phases to like 0.5, you should not hear any difference. But if we have one of them be zero and the other one of these be like 0.2, you should hear a difference. Yeah, you do. Yeah, but what's interesting then is that you could do like a 0.5 pulse over here and you could have this be 0.5 phase. And so then it would do a sine wave first and then a triangle second. What would that even sound like? like... Let's try something slightly more interesting than that. Maybe do a square followed immediately by a sawtooth. Okay, I think these features are working at this point. You shouldn't just be able to combine two waves though. We should be able to do as many as we want to be able to do. So let's generalize it and add an add button. Okay, so we add a button. And if you click the add button, um, it doesn't do anything because I don't have a function yet. Um, so adding to the DOM might be easier if I put this whole thing into a division of some kind. We'd say what document.get element by ID, waveform inputs. Call it widiv document.create elements. We're going to create a div and we're going to call this our add div. Add div.id is equal to, uh, well, we kind of have to know how many there are at this point, which we would keep track of. Yeah, I would call that, I need a variable for that. So I'm going to call that number of waves, and that's going to be one at the start at least. The ID is waveform dash and the number of waves. So we got to set the inner HTML. Let's just take it. 
Okay, but then all these ones we have to go and replace now with number of waves. Okay, great. So that'll add this HTML code there. So we go and append this, probably increment number of waves. There it goes, it popped up. Whenever I use var w, right, and I go from zero to two, well now we need to go from zero to number of waves. Right, we need to create the defaults. So, so yeah, basically we just replace them. Right, I hard coded these values in because I knew there would only be two, but now there are more. So we gotta for loop this. Sample sum is equal to zero. So then sample sum plus equals samp of w multiplied by the wave amp of w. We sum together the waveforms. The more channels you have, the more chance you have of clipping. And if you don't know what clipping is, here's a demonstration I made in Audacity. So to prevent clipping, we would want to make our amp value, and I think I can do something like one divided by the square root of number of waves. I read on a forum once that that works, but I don't actually know if it does. So I'm just gonna drop in this min max function. And before we go and push something off to sound array, let's just make sure that that value is between negative one and positive one. Get some noise in here. 2.2 octave. You know what I need is a delete button. So when we add it, we're gonna have a button that says delete. We run delete wave input, we give it the number of waves. Actually, I should hold each of the waveform's IDs in an HTML data value. That way I don't have to change the onclick script when deleting rows. We give it this dot data dot now. Is that how that would work? It's not dot data, it's dot data set. We first have to say document dot get element by ID. I remove the deleted element then we have to update all the other waves IDs with a loop. We change the ID and dataset values for each successive wave as long as they exist, but if we miss, we break out of the loop. We make the new ID one less than it, and then we got to get all the children, change all their datasets. And that will change all the datasets to be one less, dot splice, give it the index, which is IDX. Great, and then subtract from the number of waves. Okay, maybe that'll work. Cannot set properties of null. Update wave does not equal null. Okay, let's look to see if they are all the right values. No, they are not. Oh boy. So we have waveform 0, waveform 1, waveform 2. If we delete waveform 1, we don't update waveform 2. Oh, okay. It thinks i is 11 because it did 1 plus 1. Got to parse it. Parentheses, so zero, one, two. Yes, it actually functioned. Okay, well, there's a basic synth. I mean, the UI could definitely look better and there's definitely a lot more that you can do to make this more complete, but the basic ideas are executed.